Andresa. Well, um, th there are two questions here. Um, the first one on nuclear umbrellas. Um, I don't think it's at all proven that, that nuclear umbrellas have worked to stop proliferation. I think that there's an argument that there's a plausible argument you can make in certain cases that this might have been the case. But let's take the case of Japan, for example. Um, if, if it were true that all it was was the nuclear umbrella that kept Japan from going nuclear, then how do you explain the fact that, the, that Japan has been a leading advocate of nuclear disarmament for 60-some years and that Japan's current foreign minister is even calling for a policy of no first use of nuclear weapons? Japan has a, has a, a, a strong um, uh, popular uh, allergy to nuclear weapons among its citizens. And although Japan undoubtedly has a lot of uh, latent nuclear weapon capabilities, they have plenty of plutonium, they have a, a delivery system consisting of a large uh, 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 potentially intercontinental range uh, missile <coughs> uh, as a derivative of its space program, they have a number of the, uh, the certainly high computing capabilities and all the necessary technical infrastructure, yet they have politically chosen not to acquire such weapons. Um, and are seeking actively to try to get rid of them internationally using their, their diplomatic uh, 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 in influence. Um, so um, the other problem with nuclear umbrellas is that they tend to proliferate. Um, if you establish that nuclear weapons uh, uh, really do give you security, not just you security, but your friends security, then it's awfully hard to say that other countries shouldn't have those weapons as well, um, unless you want to try to sustain a double standard which is really very difficult to do. Um, so if you, if you support nuclear umbrellas, then you're doing two other things. You're, you're supporting the legitimacy of having nuclear weapons, and secondly, you're affirming their utility as military instruments, as, as useful, uh, useful weapons. And uh, I don't see how you can affirm simultaneously the value of nuclear umbrellas and purport to claim that to support nuclear disarmament. I think they're fundamentally inconsistent uh, uh, principles. Uh, and in fact, what, what states are actually doing is uh, uh, those that are not covered by other states' nuclear umbrellas is they're trying to create their own nuclear umbrellas. Um, we have a nuclear umbrella inside Pakistan. We have a nuclear umbrella inside India. We have a nuclear umbrella inside North Korea. Where will it end? Uh, will nuclear umbrellas be a norm? Every state should have one? I think this is a very dangerous idea. And uh, in fact, uh, on my recent travels, I heard one of my interviewers uh, respond to the, the question by nu nuclear umbrellas saying, the problem with nuclear umbrellas is that the concept is contagious. And I think that's a very uh, interesting way of putting it. Um, now, uh, I can't compare the world without the world before August 1945 with after, because too many things have changed. Um, uh, the Charter of the UN has established uh, some very strong international norms that uh, uh, seek to limit and regulate the use of force across borders. And in fact, there has been a, far, a, a, a substantial reduction of the use of armed force across borders. The real problem we face now in the world today in terms of armed conflict is mostly internal uh, battles that are going on in states rather than international battles. Um, but nevertheless, the, the problem obviously has not been solved yet of, of trans-border aggression. And uh, that is a remaining, a continuing problem of the UN that we're working with now. But uh, so there are different attitudes toward the use of force, far different now than there were before the end of World War II. And I think there's also a very strong norm or a taboo against the acquisition of nuclear weapons or their possession. And I think that norm is growing in, in strength and will grow in the years ahead. Over to you for a question from the Bronx. Two questions, in fact. Hi, my name is Komi Atito. Uh, I have a question for Professor Rydell. Professor Rydell said that there is no transparency in control of uh, uh, the number of nuclear weapons in the world, and then USA and Russia has 90% of nuclear weapons in the world. My question is, uh, what the United States is doing to, to control the nuclear nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament within the United States of America and then Russia? And then if the United States is not doing anything to control those big uh, countries 
a no proliferation disarmament. How the other country can follow the rule of no proliferation and disarmament rule? Thank you. Let's take a second question also. Yes. Hi. My name is Robert Jossman. I just have a quick question in reference to the uh, IEEA, in reference to the situation of non proliferation folded into disarmament. Uh, recently, according to an unpublished dossier that is still not officially, quote unquote, been released, Iran has accomplished what's referred to in military circles as a two point uh, implosion, which basically means they have achieved in a conventional sense, the ability to basically create a nuclear warhead and explode it. And considering the fact that in the past number of years, various countries have not followed through on uh, sanctions or other things that the IEA has done, is what do you plan or what would you want to do going forward to try and actually put some teeth into these, uh, in, uh, sanctions is the wrong word, but investigations or into getting these countries to agree instead of by their agreements? Thank you. Okay. Um, the U.S. policy has uh, been evolving uh, very rapidly uh, in recent years, but it's actually been evolving over over six decades. Uh, many of you might not know, for example, that on the 25th or 26th of September, 1961. President John F. Kennedy came to the United Nations and made a speech, and you can actually watch the speech on the web. There's a video of it, where he outlines a proposal for what he called general and complete disarmament, which called for the elimination of all nuclear weapons, all chemical weapons, all biological weapons, stopping their proliferation, and also limiting and regulating conventional arms. The same year, 1961, the U.S. and Russia issued a document called the McCloy Zorin Joint Statement, which jointly said that we agree on common principles for nuclear, for for general and complete disarmament involving those those two goals. So these these are very very old issues, and uh, in recent years, uh, most uh, uh, both Republican and Democratic administrations in the U.S. have placed a primary heavy emphasis on two issues. And both of the, one of them was was identified by Ambassador Kamal at the beginning of, of the uh, uh, our talk today, and that is non-proliferation, simply measures to keep additional states from getting the bomb. Simple as that. And this 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 involves export controls. It involves carrots. It involves sticks. It involves uh, penalties for for proliferation. It involves. Uh, security guarantees for states and the, if they promise not to get nuclear weapons in some cases. Uh, it involves technology transfers, it involves all kinds of other things like that, but the key goal is to stop the spread. The second uh, priority uh, is counterterrorism. It's been recognized for many, many years that once terrorists uh, can acquire uh, plutonium or highly enriched uranium, they too will be able to make nuclear weapons. And this is a really grave problem that affects everybody because the effects of these weapons uh, uh, transcend national borders and, 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 and could, could jeopardize the lives of millions. There's just no doubt about that. It's a very serious problem. So counterterrorism and nonproliferation, I would say, have, have remained in recent years the, the overwhelming priority of uh, basically all the nuclear weapon states. And it's only been recently when we've, start, we've started to see a, a resurgence or, or a revitalization of the work in the field of disarmament. Now, so far, what we've seen in disarmament has been mainly in the realm of talk uh, rather than action. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, we've seen national reaffirmations by leaders of the importance of disarmament as a goal, as a vision. Some, some have used the metaphor as a, 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 the peak of a misty mountaintop, where we, we have this distant vision of something we hope to achieve someday. Now, what's missing? Well, what's missing is a plan. As Ambassador Kamal stated, there's no timetable, there's no deadline, there's no milestones, there's no uh, regulations or domestic laws in these states that requires disarmament to be proceeding. You won't find disarmament agencies in these countries that are actively at work implementing disarmament policy. And this is what's missing, the lack of an infrastructure in the states that have nuclear weapons to actually implement disarmament. 
And the rest of the world looks at this and sees hypocrisy.